He paid for all of the sins, for all of the people, for all of time. You know, it doesn't take a double doctoral or a master's work. I'm not poking fun at anybody. Be who God created you to be, please. It always boils down to our relationship with Jesus. That, it, that relationship affects everything in our lives. God chose Israel. Our founding fathers chose God. Be a doer of the word. Because faith without works is dead, for real. That's religion, that's knowledge, that's intellect. You need to go out there and engage with your world and own your liberty. So we are in a series that has a mini-series that will have multiple mini-series as we progress. But this particular mini-series, I'm going to turn it into a college course. And this is called Foundation Stones, is the big series. And the mini-series inside of it are the six basic principles of faith. And these are really important because the Bible says that these are the six basic principles. So if the Bible says these are the six basic pr principles then we all should have a really good grasp on these principles. This is the fourth message, and we're on the second principle. I'm trucking right along. And this one is faith in God. And on a side note, I was, I was thinking about this. If, if your favorite doctrine is not in this list, just recognize that therefore your favorite doctrine is not as important to God as it is to you. Amen. Like if your favorite doctrine, doctrine is all about the love of God. The love of God is important. It's, it's, it is infinitely important. I'm not going to take anything away from it. In fact, we'll, I'll have multiple messages that the love of God is going to be a major part of these messages, but it's not one of the six. If you got a, uh, if prosperity is like your doctrine and, and God forbid anybody talks against prosperity and you'll, you'll get your knives out and go to war. It didn't make the list. It's not on there. So when we, when I read these verses, I, I want you to be looking at the six principles and measure them up against what you believe your faith is. The principles of your life. The main doctrines. You're not going to find Calvinism in here. You're not going to find uh, all, all these things that people want to hang their head on. Once saved, always saved. Wh whatever those pet doctrines are that some of us carry around, carry around like little badges, like sheriff badges, so everybody knows that we have that thing. If your pet doctrine is not in this list... It's just not as important to Jesus as it is to you. Amen. We're going to start off with our core foundation scriptures. 1 Peter chapter 2, I'm in the BSB. Verse 4, as you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men, but chosen and precious in God's sight, you also, like living stones, same way, are being built, are being built. This is one of those already not yet principles in the kingdom. You are a spiritual house, you're becoming a spiritual house, and you will be a spiritual house. Well, which is it? Yes. You are righteous, you're becoming righteous, and you will be righteous. You are sanctified. You should be being sanctified. And one day you will be sanctified. Which is it? Yes. Th these are already not yet principles of the kingdom. The kingdom is here. And the kingdom is coming. Right now the kingdom of heaven is on the inside of you. And it's not. And, and I know that people just want to, like,
put their mathematical logic to something like that and like, well, help me figure it out. Okay, I don't think that we can think like God. So when God says this is how something works and it doesn't hit our, our mental faculties the right way, that doesn't mean like, oh, well, God's wrong because my logic is way better than his. Man, is that ignorant. And people do it all the time. Well, I don't understand that, so that can't be true. Really? Right now, as we speak, the greatest scientific minds in the whole world do not know how a bumblebee flies. Look it up. It defies the laws of physics and flight and all the stuff and things. They have no idea how a bumblebee flies, and no sucker's been flying before the scientists were ever born, before science was invented. The bumblebee knows how it flies. And the greatest minds, the greatest earthly scientific minds don't. So who's smarter, the bumblebee or the science? You are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture... If your belief cannot be verified by two or three witnesses from the scriptures, it's an opinion. And if you ever have an opinion that you believe is a belief, you are going to put yourself, your family, and your future in harm's way in ways that I, I can't even describe. I've had to deal with this lots of times with lots of people, and most people will not lay down their opinions because once you call it a belief, well, here's what I believe. Yeah, but here's what the Bible says. Yeah, but here's what I believe. Whoops. Now we got a problem. For it stands in Scripture. See, I lay in Zion a stone, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who believes in him will never be put to shame. Notice that him and the stone in Zion are interchangeable. He is the rock of our salvation. He doesn't change. He doesn't break. He's not moved by the weather. He doesn't, they, heaven didn't freak out because they announced we were going to have a scandemic. What are we going to do, Gabriel? I don't know. I, they got me. I didn't know this was coming. He's immovable. He's a rock. If you ever want to be stable, if you ever want to have true peace in your life, anchor yourself to the rock. Seven to you who believe then, this stone is precious. <laughs> Man, is that a mouthful. But to those who do not believe... The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. You know, it's such an interesting statement that for those who don't believe, the stones become the cornerstone. Doesn't, doesn't that sound contrary? Like, no, if I don't believe, well, then that stone's not my corner. No, God doesn't change what he's going to do or who he is based upon what you believe. If you don't want to believe, that's fine. He's putting the stone where the stone goes. You can believe and agree, or you can doubt and fight. But God's going to do what God's going to do. It is way better to just submit. The way to the top is from the bottom. Humility is the energy that will be, make you successful in the kingdom of God. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Jesus said, it's in red, it's in red ink in your Bible if you've got a red letter Bible. Jesus said, it is impossible but that offenses will come. It is impossible if Jesus says something's impossible, you don't get to use the Bible to make Jesus wrong. Oh, all things are possible. No, Jesus said impossible, but that offenses will come. Everyone in here, guaranteed by Jesus' red letters, 
will have opportunity to be offended. What separates the people who end up going on, maturing, growing, becoming successful, blessed, having the promises of God manifest in their life, the, what separates the two are, will you keep the offense or not? You will be offended. In fact, I'll promise half this room, I'll offend you before the day's over. <laughs> promise. Scout's honor, I'll offend you. I'm good at it. I never wanted to be. It's one of those skills that just kind of showed up in my life. Where'd that come from? Jesus the same way. If you walk contrary to the flow of what Jesus is trying to do in your life, he will offend you. The river of God flows from the temple. And if you are with the flow of the river, you are in agreement and you are in unity with that flow. But if you fight against it, if you go contrary to it, you could literally blame God for your problems. Where everything's a struggle. There's a demon on every doorknob. Every, every morning I wake up, there's a new spiritual fight that I have to... Really? For real? <laughs> Get in the river. Be in the river. If you're, it's a spiritual fight for you every day and you just got to grind and groan every moment, then you're just not doing it right. We're supposed to be with him in the ark and there can be all kinds of storm out there. There can be world-destroying storm out there and we're with him in the ark petting a llama. That, that's what some people are doing, or cats. Petting cat. You know, there was no cats on the ark. There was lions and tigers. No house cats on the ark. You do not have a verse that proves there was one there. I'm telling you. The only reason we got house cats is because lions and tigers ate wrong stuff and then they shrunk. <laughs> it's a genetic malfunction. Faith in God, uh, I'll get back to this. Faith, faith in God. <clears throat> faith in God <laughs> is our willing submission to the process of being built into that sacred place, that spiritual house that we are called to become. Your position of having faith in God is what allows God to build you into who he desires for you to be. If you've got faith in you, you're going to be the awesome version of you. You're going to look in the mirror and say, man, you're just the best looking thing ever. <laughs> and everybody loves you. You're the most awesome thing in the whole world. And that mirror and you are going to have a great relationship until you don't. That is not God's opinion. And it will be lonely eventually. When you think that you're the best, you're eventually going to be lonely. Because I'll guarantee you pretty much nobody else has that opinion of you. We all think that Jesus is the best. But, you know, you do you. Hebrews chapter 5, these are... Our mini-series, Foundation Verses 511 to 66. This is one of those places. In, a, in fact, the whole book of Hebrews, if you just take all the numbers out of it, is twice as good. Just That's just a side note. You can actually go online and print off a non-numbered version of like the book of Hebrews and just read it like a letter, like the guy that wrote it meant for it to look. And I'm not mad at the numbers or nothing. Like, thank God they're there so that hope he can follow me when I'm telling her to go to a verse. But there, there is a lot of revelation that we miss because we chop it up by the numbers. So please read your Bibles often. Study your Bible without numbers and find out what the Lord might reveal to you. Starting in verse 11, we have much to say about this, but it's hard to explain. 
This is canonized scripture from an anointed, chosen writer. You know, Jesus was the perfect pastor with the perfect church, with the perfect doctrine, doing it perfectly, and had people quit. Anybody? Nobody. Someone? Amen. Not only had people quit, had people quit mad, stomped away. Rich young, rich, rich young ruler went away sad. Quit the church hard. Judas was for sale and sold Jesus out. And he was one of the elders in the church. It's not the perfection of the church or the minister. That'd be a great place for a praise God. You missed it. It is us. It's us. This, the author of the book of Hebrews, was writing to people that were maybe more committed than a lot of folks in American Christianity, for sure, churchianity. And he was saying, there's so much I got to say, but these things are hard to explain. <laughs> and the folks he was writing to could probably quote the Torah, which is the first five books of the Bible. They could probably quote it. And he's saying, man, I got stuff I need to say to you, but it's hard to explain because you're dull. And they, and they could quote the Torah likely. These, he wrote this letter to the Hebrews. Th these were Jewish folks, deeply into Judaism. They, it, as a, if you were raised Orthodox Jew by your 13th birthday, your bar mitzvah, you had to be able to quote the Torah. Yeah. <laughs> That's part of your bar mitzvah. You quote the Torah, we throw you a party. So he's writing to people that could quote five books of the Bible. There might be folks in this room who can't quote five verses. And he's saying it was hard for him to explain the things that he needed to explain. To those folks, how much harder now? Amen. Because you're dull of hearing. You don't know me. You don't know if I'm dull or not. Okay. I'll just read the Bible. Although by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to reteach you the basic principles of God's work. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is still an infant, inexperienced in the message of righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use, not Sunday use, All right, that'll land later. Who by constant use have trained their senses to distinguish good from evil. I cannot tell you how, my, how many times I thanked God that he helped me with discernment for the last four years. I'll guarantee you I'm alive today because God helped me with discernment. This is saying that if we are not constantly using this, you will not develop the discernment in your life that you need. Cannon fodder for the enemy. Therefore, let us leave the elementary teachings about Christ and go on to maturity. Not like, look... Uh, after he just like insulted him, like, man, I got stuff that's hard to explain. You guys are dull of hearing. After he said all that, notice he's encouraging them, exhorting them, okay, grow up. You know, we, we can't even do this in our society anymore. You can't tell someone the truth and say, hey, there's this screwed up place in your life. You need to get this fixed. Why did you get this way? What's going on with you? And then say, okay, here, let me help you unpack all that. You've already lost this person. As soon as you pointed out one thing wrong in somebody's life today, they're done. They're out. They're slashing your tires, keying your truck, and down the road. 
Look what he did. You're dull of hearing. I got things that, you, that I need to explain. You should be rabbis and you're still um, on breast milk. What is wrong with you people? And then he goes, therefore, let me tell you how to grow. You know what his audience said? Thank you. Thanks. We needed that. Therefore, let us leave the elementary teachings about Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works. Repentance from dead works, that's number one. Here's where we're measuring your pet doctrines. Let's see if your pet doctrine fits in these things. Number one, foundation of repentance from dead works. Repentance from dead works, we covered that last time. The difference between metanoia and metamelomai, which... Most people do the metamelomai, and that's not the repentance that God asked for. If you don't understand what I just said, then go back and get a copy of the teaching. Repentance from dead works today, faith in God. And I know that most people see that and they're like, I got that. Faith in God? I got faith in God coming out my pockets. Wookie. The third one, instruction about baptisms. Note the S. You ask the average Christian today, the average 40-year-in-a-church Christian today, and say, hey, what's baptism? Oh, it's going in the water, getting dunked like a donut. Okay. Baptisms, plural. There's more than one. Four, laying on of hands. You know how many denominations don't believe in laying on of hands? And these are foundational principles. And there's more to laying on of hands than just someone sick and you need to touch them. There's a lot more. We'll get there. Five, the resurrection of the dead. All right, I got that one. <laughs> okay? Let me just ask you this. Are you resurrected now or not? Uh, wait, what? Did you die? We'll get there. And then last, eternal judgment. Ugh. Steve's a Baptist. <laughs> nope, I'm a Bibleist. The Bible says that one of the six foundation, foundational faith principles that you should have in your life is understanding and being able to interact with and teach other people about eternal judgment. Well, we, we don't, we're a grace church. There's no such thing as eternal judgment. Well, golly, Wally, someone should have told the Bible writers that this whole thing changed in the last, I don't know, 10, 20, 30 years. Maybe God miswrote the Bible. Should we take Hebrews out? Or maybe they're right and our pet doctrines are wrong. And this we will do if God permits. I can tell you, Hand to God, I'm going to do it. <laughs> I don't know if you're going to stay for it, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to force the five people that are guaranteed to be here, and we're going to sit and we're going to listen about these principles. It is impossible for those who have once been enlightened. It's another one of those impossibles. When the Bible says something's impossible, it is impossible for those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the goodness of the word of God, the logos of God, and the powers of the coming age, and then have fallen away to be restored to repentance. Impossible. You play with fire, you'll be burnt. There's a lot of folks that play with their salvation. Because they themselves are crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting him to an open shame. The Father in heaven, not so up thumb about that. His Son deserves honor. Your life will reflect the honor that you give to his Son or not. 
Amen. His son is called the Word of God. If you're not interacting with the Word of God, you are not honoring his son. If you can sleep while the Word of God goes forth, you're not honoring the Word of God. Faith is a sounder guide than reason. Reason can only go so far, but faith has no limits. That's from Blaise Pascal. He was a famous French philosopher, mathematician, and scientist in the 1600s. Man, would to God we could have famous mathematicians, philosophers, and scientists that would quote incredible things about God like that in today's world. A.W. Tozer said, faith in God is to be demonstrated, not defined. A believer know this is me now, a believer knows that the future is unknown, therefore it would be wise to trust the one who knows the future. That's faith. I'm going to read James chapter 2, verses 14, and then 17 through 20. James 2, 19 is the most sarcastic verse in the whole Bible. How do I know that? I'm kind of drawn to the sarcastic ones. Maybe you'll find, go talk to mom, she'll find you the most loving verse in the Bible. Me? Sarcastic. Verse 14 says, what good is it, my brothers? If someone claims to have faith, but has no deeds, can such faith save him? <laughs> and before you're, you go and do your measuring stick, what you call a deed and what God calls a deed might not be the same thing. Well, I... You know, I gave my brother's cousin's nephew five bucks one time because they were out of milk. Well, we should just erect a statue to you because you've got to be like the incarnate Christ. What God calls deeds, what God calls living by faith, is likely not what churchianity defines living by faith as. Verse 17. So too, faith by itself, if it does not result in action, is dead. Wait a minute. Faith can be dead? I don't know. It's what the Bible says. How, how can your faith die? Because you're not living what you believe, supposedly. Well, I believe that God is good, and, and I'm going to serve him. Okay, are you doing that? Well, no, I'm going to one day. I've had people tell me this, where they say, you know, not right, I'm not going um, to uh, become a Christian right now. I believe in Christ. I believe, you know, all the cross and all that stuff and, and things and resurrection, blah, blah, blah. I'm just not going to do it right now. You know, later on in my life, I'll make that choice. You don't believe. You believe what you do right now. That's what you believe. What you do right now. And I'm not getting into anybody's P's and Q's, but I can tell you your faith system is exactly representative of the way you live your life. That's what you believe. And some people believe things that results in death. And some people live in a way that makes their faith die. Did you know you could do that? Well, I really believe that God loves me and I really believe I'm saved. But you're over here living this way? Yeah. Do you not think that that's affecting your faith? Do you not think that's killing your faith? If I was, 
If I believed that I was married to Kay, and I believed I was a good husband, I believed all that, and I went to my girlfriend's house every night, and I really, really, really believed that I was a good husband, and I was really, really married to Kay, I have a piece of paper that proves it somewhere. You would, you would call, you would laugh at me. You would make fun of me. You would hold me up as an example of pure hypocrisy. And I'm using a flamboyant example on purpose because what does it translate into your life? Well, here's what I believe. But, and I can tell you that anything that you have after the but is what you really believe. Before the but. That's just what you want people to think you believe. After the but is what you actually really believe. Amen. 18, but someone will say, you have faith and I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds and I will show you my faith by my deeds. 19, you believe that God is one? Most sarcastic verse. You believe that God is one? Good for you. <laughs> See, I'm not the only one. James did it. I think James is real. I think he watches our sermons and he's like, I like that, Steve. <laughs> just something about him that I just. <laughs> you believe that God is one? Good for you. Even the demons believe that. And shudder. Has your faith ever made you shudder? Don't answer. Hypothetical. Have you literally sat there, meditated on God, had an encounter with God, and literally have shuddered at the awesomeness, the goodness, the love, the undeserved favor and forgiveness that you, and shut, literally shuddered at God? If the answer is no, then I'll just say that demons believe more than you. And I would hate to be a person that says, I'm a believer in God. Yeah, how much? Less than demons. That might not be a good measuring stick to have. I want to believe more than demons. I hope that you do as well. And if you've really never spent the time to take your heart all the way to that point, where the, the character, the nature, the power, the presence of God literally shakes you, then demons are farther down the road of believing than you are. I didn't write it. Verse 20, oh foolish man. <laughs> Loving me some James. Oh foolish man. Do you want evidence that faith without deeds is worthless? We went from dead to worthless. The word for faith is the Greek word pistis. I'm, I'm going to get a little bit language geek on you, but I promise I'm going to do it in a way everybody's going to track with me, and I'm going to pull you back out of the geek ditch. So just stick with me. The word for faith in the Greek is pistis. And... Pistis is a noun. Those of you that remember high school, when you were sober, noun is a person, place, or thing. It, it's, it's something that um, is tangible. You and I are a noun. We are proper nouns. We're people. And faith is an actual substance. It's a noun. Pistis is a noun. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now faith is, sorry, that's, I just quoted to King James because that's how it's in my head. Uh, no, that, yep, that's cool. <laughs> wow. Touche, Hopi. <laughs> faith is the substance of things hoped for. I put it in my notes wrong. You're wonderful. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Evidence of unseen things. Man, think about that. 
There is evidence of things that are not seen. <laughs> Every time I think about that, it's just like, <laughs> well, I can't see it. <laughs> Which, you know what's so irritating to me? Over the last four years, they have yet, yet, listen to me, they have yet to find the COVID virus. There is no medical or scientific evidence of the actual coronavirus that they've been talking about, CV-19. They have yet to find it. And 8 billion people believe in it. And those are the same people that will tell you you're a fool for believing in an invisible God. The God that made the universe, I believe in him and I can't see him. You believe something that they haven't proven yet exists in the universe, and you believe that more than the one that created the universe. And I'm the fool. Okay. Faith is a substance. It's an actual thing. It's tangible in the spirit. Spirit has substance. It's just not natural substance. It doesn't have flesh and bone but it's still substance. Spirit is not something that doesn't exist. Like we're all imagining the spirit. The spirit realm is more real than this realm. The spirit realm made this realm. The creator is more real than the creation. So spirit is more real than that chair you're sitting in that you think like you haven't even thought about it because it's so real to you. You literally haven't even used your brain to think about the fact that there's a chair holding up your butt. The spirit is more real than that. By his stripes, we are healed is more real than the chair you're sitting in. More real, not less real. So then what's more real, the symptoms you're experiencing or his stripes? Pistis is a noun. Mark 5.34, Jesus said, daughter, talking to the woman with the issue of blood. If you got the Thursday email, there was stuff in there about this. Daughter said, Jesus, your faith has healed you. Your faith, which is a thing. It's a thing. If I walked up to someone and said, hey, how you doing? I got a headache. And I said, okay, we'll take two Tylenol, and I'll check on you in an hour. And then I come back in an hour. Hey, how's your headache? That's gone. Your Tylenol has healed you. Jesus said, your faith has healed you. In heaven, faith is better than Tylenol. You can take faith, and it will do for you whatever that faith was created to do. It's a real thing. The next word, if you follow the entomology of a word and and you delineate it down to where you get to the the lexical form is, is the language geek stuff, which just means down to the root of the word. The next a delineation of this word would be the verb form, which is where you and I would use the term belief. See, this is an action. We went from a noun, a thing, to an action. I have faith, therefore I believe. Makes sense. The verb is what you're doing. Verbs are action. Hebrews 11:6. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. So without the substance of faith, the pistis, it is impossible to please God, to please him. For he that comes to God must believe. Action, verb. Substance, faith, pistis. The verb is pisteo. So you can hear it, same word, pistis, pisteo. It's of the same uh, family. And so I have faith, and now that produces in me the action. If I have love, it will produce an action like kindness. 
If I say I love, if I say I love Pastor Ryan, I'm going to be kind to him. I'm going to serve him. I'm going to uh, do things for him if he asks me. Right? Yeah. Now the reverse can also be true, which means I can do things for him. I can be kind to him and not love him. I can just do it to do it. Stupid guy texting me all the time. Fine, I'll do the thing. There doesn't have to be love there. But if there's love, there has to be the other things. If there's faith, there has to be belief. There has to be believing if there's real, authentic faith. You cannot have faith without the believing, the verb form of that faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God because anyone who approaches him must believe, must believe that he exists and he rewards those who earnestly seek him. You believe that about your father, that there's a reward for living the life the way that he called you to live it. I, I hope you do. There is a reward for living your life the way God intended for you to live it. And there's consequences for not. And God didn't do either of those to you. Matthew 8, 13, then Jesus said to the centurion, the centurion, Jesus said, is the greatest faith that he's seen while he was on earth. Go, as you have believed, so will it be done for you. So the, the way things are done in our life are directly in concordance, accordance with what we verb believe, not the substance the verb, not the noun, the verb. I have faith, great. So this is like a, a pot of gold. If I have a pot of gold of faith and I need something, then I will take a gold coin and I will use it to buy. I will verb, I will do something with it. The next, the next delineation down is the adjective. And the adjective is pistos. This is where we get the term faithful. God is faithful. He's full of faith and he's faithful. If you're full of faith, you're a faithful person. This is why the term faithfulness means what it means. If I'm faithful to my wife, you know what that means. That means I'm not in, in an extramarital relationship. I'm not giving my soul to any other person. My love goes directly to my wife. The, my covenant love goes directly to my wife and nobody else gets it. You know that means faithful. Why, do you ever think about it? Why did we put the word faith in that kind of a context? Because I so believe in my covenant and I so believe in what her and I have together that I am full of faith to the point where it's driving me, compelling me to be committed to the nth degree. I am full of faith. I am faithful. Adjective. It describes how I am. It's a virtue of me. It's a character of me. I am a faithful man unto my wife. I am a faithful servant unto my God. The word believer is an adjective, not a noun. If the Bible says you're a believer, it's describing you as a person. You're a believing Christian. Christian noun, believing adjective. It describes what the noun is. And so if you are going to be a faithful person, that means that you are the noun of, of Christian. You have the substance of faith. You are operating in that substance to the degree that it's showing up so much that people have literally commented they are faithful as a Christian. Adjective describes the noun. So if we continue down the entomological trail, then we get to the eventual lexical form of this word, the root of this word, which is pisteo, and pisteo, or I'm sorry, pitho, and pitho 
is the word that you're going to find mostly in the Bible as trust. The root of faith is trust. Trust requires relationship. Trust requires experience. Trust requires persuasion. I'm going to give you some, some verses here. I'm going to go through these real quick. And I'm going to show you the different ways that this word is. This is the primary verb of the word faith. Luke 10, or I'm sorry, Luke 18, 9 and 10a. To some who trusted in their own righteousness and viewed others with contempt, he, Jesus, also told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray. You might remember the parable. One guy was a tax collector. The Bible called him a Republican. <laughs> and he went into the temple praying and he said that he beat his chest and he said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And then there was another person, a Pharisee, that went into the temple and said, God, thank you that you didn't make me as terrible as all these other people like that <laughs> Republican. And, the, and Jesus said when he told this parable, one of these two men left justified. Can you guess which one? To some who trusted in their own, relation, in their own righteousness. That is the word pitho. They trusted in their own righteousness. They had experience with their own righteousness. They had relationship with their own righteousness. They were convinced of their own righteousness outside of God. Steve Castle is a righteous man because of Jesus. And Steve Castle is an unrighteous man without Jesus. There is no good thing in me except Christ. Acts 14, 19, then some Jews arrived from Antioch and Iconium and won over the crowds, Pitho, won over. They convinced, they persuaded through their words, through how they pre uh, presented themselves, the way they portrayed themselves to be. You know, people can portray themselves to be all kinds of stuff. The last four years, we've had all kinds of medical professionals and scientists that have stood up and said, yeah, safe and effective. Oh, sorry, killed six million people. Oops. But we trusted you. You had a white lab coat, which is just embarrassing that someone wears a white lab coat and we trust them. <laughs> if they say they're from the government and they're here to help, <laughs> you should slap the mag and pull the hammer. Ask for verification. That one's going to get me in trouble. <laughs> Nobody from the government comes to your house to help. None of the checks that you got from the government were to help you. They were to enslave you. They were to buy your allegiance. And they still are there to buy your allegiance. If they can get you paid off, they can own you. Then some Jews arrived at, from Antioch and Iconium and won over the crowds. They stoned Paul and dragged him outside the city, presuming he was dead. You know what's hilarious? If you read the verse right before this, you know what they were doing to Paul? Worshipping him. They were literally about to make a blood sacrifice and put it on the altar in his name. He went from hero to zero in one verse. It's like Jesus. Oh, uh, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the Lord. Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Woohoo! Crucify him, crucify him. Crowds are finicky. They're fickle. The right person can come along with the right speech and the right tonality, and they can present themselves well. 
and they can, they can be really eloquent with their words and pontificate with the best of them. And people will say, you know, I used to believe that we breathed air, but after I listened to the scientists, I now know that we should go live on the bottom of the lake. <laughs> Why do you believe that? Because they said it so well. Oh, you can't. You need air. Well, that's just what you say, stupid preacher. Okay. Have fun. They just went from offering sacrifices because they believed that Paul was a god to listening to some people from a neighboring town come over and say, he's not a god, we should kill him. Y yeah, that, that's what we meant. We, we, we didn't really mean we were going to sacrifice offerings to him because we thought he was a god. That was all just for funsies. We actually wanted to kill him. We were just waiting for you to come and convince us. That's the power of convincing. You know, there are, there are parents right now in America, parents, mommies and daddies, who are convinced that they should raise their little boy as a girl. So much so that they should take him to a doctor and hack his body apart. They are that convinced. And I know that this whole, that we groan when we say that. But how many stupid things have you been convinced of? How about this one? Well, if I keep all my money, well, then I'll have more. The Bible comes along and says, give, and it shall be given unto you. Pressed down, shaken together, running over. <laughs> stupid Bible. What do you know? Yeah, what does the Bible know? The... The world says, hey, if you're sick, you should get a vaccine. The Bible comes along and says, by stripes you're healed. Stupid Bible, stripes. What does that even mean? Whatever you believe, whatever you, whatever you believe, you have been convinced of. Now, the sad thing is, is that sometimes what we believe, we've convinced ourselves. Well, really, the reason I don't have any friends is because people just don't like to hear the truth. And I just tell the truth all the time, and, that, and people don't like that. And so that's why I don't have any friends. Or you're a jerk. You could be a jerk. Well, if I am a jerk, God made me that way. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. We don't get to put this on God. If you're a jerk, you made you that way. Well, no, 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 it was my parents. When I was 10, my parents were mean to me, and that's why I'm a jerk. No, 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 that's why you were a jerk. You is a jerk because you're choosing to. You believe, you believe it's part of your nature. You believe it's part of your identity. Now, you've believed it. You've justified it. When you convince yourself of something, you are likely likely to not get out of it. If I convince you of something and it turns out wrong, at some point you'd be like, ah, stupid Steve lied to me, darn preachers, you know how they are. And you can, and you can reject it and go on and believe whatever. But if you believe you of something, if you convince you of something, if you persuade you of something, that sucker's in there and it is rooted like a treble hook in a bass. It ain't coming out. You're going to have to shred the whole fish to get that sucker out. And a lot of people aren't willing to do that. They're not willing to shred the belief system to get out the hook. And so they'll just go on. Well, I'll just go find me a church that believes the way I believe. All right, go find you a church that believes you should be sick and poor and broke and, and a fodder for the enemy and, uh, and a slave to the American government. There's plenty of them out there. In fact, we are a minority church. We were, I'm not sure now because there's, I am the longest serving pastor in all of Lena. I'm the oldest serving, longest serving pastor in all of Lena. You have the longest leadership of any church in all of Lena. And, I know. Shocking. And at one point, I'm not sure now because all the leadership has changed at all the churches, 
but we were the only church of the seven churches. We were the only church that believed in the biblical definition of marriage and the biblical definition of gender and sexuality. Only church, one out of seven. That's where we're at. Beloved, listen to me. We live in the Midwest, in the cornfields, in conservative Stevenson County, and one of seven churches believes in the biblical definition of marriage, gender, and sexuality? It's going to get worse before it gets better. I promise you. And when your great-grandkid gets neutered by their convinced children that you didn't take to church because you didn't want them to have their feelings hurt by you dragging them to church, there ain't no, there ain't no coming back from that. You don't get to sew that back on and fix everything. It's done. That's the world that we're in. Acts 26, 28, then Agrippa said to Paul, can you persuade me in such a short time to become a Christian? Um, can you switch that over to the King James, sis? I know that's difficult, although you did it. Never mind, not grippable. Then Agrippa said to Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. King Agrippa. Paul was pretty good at what he did. I've stood in front of some leaders and I've tried to convince them they're more hard headed than Agrippa. <laughs> or I'm worse than Paul, or both. Paul was, was testifying as to what Jesus did in his life, and the king. King Agrippa said, man, what you are saying is like trying to push me over the hump of believing this stuff. Your words matter. Your words matter a lot. And I know we don't believe that. You convince yourself, well, I just, you know, I'm just sick all the time. I'm just sick, 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 sick all the time. And, and the enemy's always after me. And he, and he wakes me up in the morning and he's got some spiritual trial and, and problem for me today. It's just the way my life is. You have convinced yourself. I can come along and say, no, the kingdom of God is, is the fruits of the spirit. Love, joy, peace. Love, no, 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 I don't get none of that in my life. The uh, Acts 14, 7 or 17 or 17, 14, something like that, says that the kingdom of God is not in meat and drinks, but it's in righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Well, that's not my experience. That's what it is. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Well, I don't have none of that stuff. Well, then you should get in the kingdom. I'm in the kingdom. No, you're not. That's the kingdom. I, I didn't, it's not my kingdom. I don't get to tell you how it works. The guy that's called the king of the kingdom gets to define the kingdom and how it works. And so the king says in his kingdom, it's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. That's what he says. Well, I'm not having that. Okay. Call your hotline or, or whatever, whatever makes you feel better about you convincing yourself that you're doing it right when the fruits are not bearing witness to what Jesus said they're supposed to bear witness to. Hebrew, Hebrews 13, 17 and 18. Now follow me here. These are going to be those verses that nobody likes to hear in church, especially from a preacher. You'll be okay. Just clench your, do this and cl close your lips and nobody will know. Obey your leaders and submit to them. The word obey is pitho. Trust. You know what we don't have in 2024 for most Christians sitting in churches today? Because they've gone through church hurt and they, you know, my, my great grandpa had a cousin's nephew's brothers who a preacher did him wrong and so, you know, we can't trust preachers. Says the same people that will just follow a politician around like a lap dog. They'll follow CNN but the preachers, they're the problem in America. Obey your leaders. Submit to them. For they watch over your souls. Trust. Pitho. 
your leaders and submit to them for they watch over your souls as those who must give an account. I have to give an account about how I lead you. Do you all know that? Yeah. You think I take that seriously? Yeah. I do. I don't get to stand up here and say what I want. I've tried that before. It turns terrible. I have to repent a lot. To this end, allow them to lead you with joy. Man, if I could have a bumper sticker. <laughs> I would love to lead you with joy and not with grief. For that would be of no advantage to you. Notice it's of no advantage to you. Not me. Well, I'll show Pastor Steve. I just won't do anything that he preaches. Okay. Showed me. <laughs> that would be of no advantage to you. Pray for us. And <laughs> you notice it, how the preacher says, man, these people, pray for us. <laughs> pray for us. We are convinced, Pitho, he used it twice in these two verses. We are convinced that we have a clear conscience and desire to live honorably in every way. To be convinced is Pitho, trust. This is the verb of believe, of faith. 2 Timothy 1.12, for this reason, even though I suffer as I do, I am not ashamed, for I know whom, whom, W-H-O-M, huge word, vastly important, I know whom I have believed. You know, you'd think, like, hold on, he must have said that wrong. It's supposed to be what I believed. If you are fully in the kingdom, if you have the faith of God, then it's not a what you believe, it's a who you believe. If it's not true in Jesus, it's not true. It's not about what, it's about who. When I have these conversations with people and they say, well, yeah, I know the Bible says that, but here's what I believe. What they just said to me, and I don't usually challenge people, I just kind of nod and like, okay, fine, that's where you're at. But most of the time, on the inside of me, my heart is screaming, oh, so Jesus is not who you believe. It's his Bible. He's the author. And so when I say, hey, these are the scriptures, and someone will twist them, make them say whatever they want, then what they said was Jesus is not good enough. I need to twist Jesus into the shape that I want him to be. Man, don't do that. For this reason, even though I suffer as I do, I'm not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed. Pisteo, Pito. And I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him for that day. I trust him to guard what I need guarded. Notice his faith was in the who, so therefore the trust could be in what the who does. Relationship. So then what's unbelief? This is really important because this is, I get this question probably this would be the, one of the top questions that I get. Well then, why am I not healed? If I believe that in healing, but I'm not experiencing healing, what's the problem? And I'll say, well, unbelief. And then usually they get mad and you know throw, throw a temper tantrum and I give them a boo-boo and then they get over it. And then I reel them back in and I say, look, you can have belief and unbelief at the same time. <laughs> you can believe by his stripes you're healed and believe that your knee hurts. They can both be happening at the same time. Now, eventually one's going to win. It's up to you. But both of those things can be happening at the same time. They're like two, uh, Andrew says it this way, they're like two opposing horses. If I had a, two Clydesdales, two equally sized Clydesdales, and I tied a rope to both of them, and I made them both pull, one's called faith and one's called unbelief, you're going to have tens of thousands of pounds of muscle exerted and zero change. 
So if you're believing that by his stripes I'm healed, but you're also unbelieving at the same time, and you've got so much of that going on that it's made that rope taut, you got a ton of belief, but you also have a ton of unbelief. You know, this world is filled with unbelief. Go turn a TV on. You got nine commercials, and eight of them are for some medication for some sickness you don't even have, but by the end of the commercial, you're convinced you got it. I had one of those symptoms once. I must have that thing. I was in a hotel room one time, and the TV automatically was just on when I walked in the room. And before I could find the remote, I was about to tear the room apart because it was just like medical commercial after medical. And they said, do you have restless leg syndrome? It's when you lay in bed and your legs move. I'm like, I got restless leg syndrome every day, all day. Kay's always mad at me because I'm shaking my leg. Will you stop it? Quit shaking. You're moving the table. I, my leg's just moving. I'm like, maybe I got restless leg. I literally had that thought. It lasted about two seconds. Maybe I have restless leg syndrome. Shut up! <laughs> Where is the remote? <laughs> I'm going to have to pay the, the fee for uh, destroying a TV in a hotel room. I'm not even Aerosmith. Unbelief is the word apista. A pista. Pista, faith. Pistos. A, you put an A in front of it, it negates it. It's like un. And so it's unfaith. That's why we get the word unbelief. It's unfaith. What does unfaith mean? Let me show you. Hebrews 3, 12. See to it, brothers, that none of you has a wicked heart of unfaith that turns away from the living God. So unfaith is having faith in something other than God. Unfaith is actually faith. It's just in the wrong thing. You can't not believe. There's no such thing. You have to believe something. You either believe right or believe wrong. You either believe truth or believe a lie. You believe fact or you believe fiction. You believe him, Christ, or not. A pista. So if faith in God is what we're supposed to have. That's the foundational principle. Then unbelief would be faith in anything but God. Faith in money. Faith in the government. Dear Jesus, help you. Faith in a medical procedure, a doctor. Faith in, faith in, faith in, faith in. Faith in K? K is awesome, y'all. Try that with me. Kay's awesome, and I don't have faith in her. I don't. And she don't have faith in me. God bless her. Now, we believe that we, are, we have the character of faithfulness, and, and we're trustworthy, and all those kind of things that we're supposed to be in Christ. I can't have that without Christ. There's no faithfulness without the nature of Christ on the inside of a person. You pull Christ out of a person and say, okay, go live faithful. <laughs> with how many people? <laughs> Love the one you're with, I guess. A pista, unbelief. I had a vision. This was about as close to an open vision as I've ever had in my entire life. This was about two years before we came to Illinois. I guess it would be about 14 years ago. And we were struggling with trying to get the transition of leaving my, my big old six-figure income job with all the cool stuff and things and the title. And we had seven houses and cars and motorcycles and boats and stuff and things and misery. And I knew that I knew that I knew that we were supposed to come back here and start the church. And I was so wrestling with that. Like, how do I unpack this stuff? Like, I spent the last 12 years doing this with my life. Did I miss it? Is it right? Is it wrong? You know, just all of that, that went along with that process. And I would spend three to four hours every day just meditating the Word of God, reading the Scriptures. I had a folding table that I set up in our living room 
that I had all my books back then, because there wasn't a lot of online stuff available. I had all my books spread out, all my concordances, my vines, and all my Bible, and all. And I'd spend two or three hours, four hours, sitting at that desk and then roaming around the living room almost every day. And I was really struggling with coming back here and doing this because, like, do I put my family back into poverty? Because we grew up in poverty. And so I promised Kay, I literally promised to her, that if you marry me, we will raise our children in a home, not a trailer, not an apartment, not Section 8, not a housing complex. We will raise our children in a home. They will have clothes. They will have food. Because we didn't. And so I promised those things to Kay. And now here God's calling me into ministry. And all I can think of is I am going to do it like all the people that didn't do it well. And I'm going to break my family after I made this promise to my family. And now we got grown, not grown kids, but they were older. They know what it's like to be hungry. And I, I was so wrestling with this. And for weeks and months, I would roam around the living room meditating on what the Lord told me to do. Go back, start the church, go back, start the church. Yeah, but, yeah, but. And while one of those days I was really intense and I, was, and I went into a vision The we had a fireplace right here, and the fireplace disappeared. And I was outside, walking along the edge. I was on this path that was like on this cliff that was like 1,000 or 2,000 feet up, and down below was the ocean. You can probably picture this, like this beautiful ocean scene down there. And I'm walking this beautiful path, this lush grass, and I'm just looking at this beautiful ocean. I'm walking down this path. I was in my living room. Now I'm on a path. And I look over, and I'm holding hands with Jesus. And Jesus and I are walking down this path together. <laughs> and I kind of knew it was a vision, but I didn't know it was a vision. It was so real, so real. And I'm walking with Jesus, and I remember just like having this thing like, uh, what should I say? <laughs> I, I can ask anything, like, and I'm just walking with Jesus. He's not saying anything. I'm, like, too scared to say anything. I know. Awesome preacher. And I'm just walking with Jesus. And I, I can't explain it, but I'm with peace. I'm just with peace. I just know that I'm walking hand in hand with peace. And every once in a while, I'd like look at him out the corner of my eye, on my peripheral vision. He's just smiling and walking with me. Who would smile and walk with me? What is wrong with him? <laughs> like, I knew me. I still was struggling with all the stuff that I came out of. I just came out of some terrible times in that part of my life and, and spiritual coma and did stupid stuff. Why would Jesus want to be anywhere within 10,000 miles of me? And here he's walking with me hand in hand. He's holding my hand. And I remember thinking, I really want to ask him about how do I do this? How do I get into my destiny? Like, how do I make this transition and not wreck my family, wreck my future, cause tons of problems for a bunch of people in the name of Jesus? I would rather die than hurt someone in the name of Jesus. And so I'm like trying to brew up enough courage to ask Jesus about this. And we're walking. And I almost got there. And right before I was about to ask him, like I kind of remember almost like taking a breath and I was going to, I'm going to ask him. And he stopped. And so I turned to him and he turned to me. And so we're facing each other. And so he's holding my hand. It's in between us. And he said, do you trust me? <laughs> Man, can I tell you that what John went through in John chapter 21 when the Lord said, do you love me? <laughs> I have a revelation of that like few people. He said, do you trust me? And I literally quoted the Bible. I said, yea, Lord, you know I trust you. Memorize the Bible in King James, and that's just how it came out. And he looked at me, and he was holding his hand 
was under my hand because when he turned, his hand went under, so my hand was on top of his hand. And he took his other hand and he put it on top of my hand so that my hand was in a sandwich between his two hands. And he looked at me again and he said, do you trust me? And I had that thing happen on the inside of me where I know if he asks you a second time. And so I kind of looked down because I had a little bit of shame or the realization that maybe I wasn't trusting him. And when I looked down, I seen his hand on top of my hand. And I could see my hand through the hole in his hand. And I was very aware of the sacrifice that he made for me. And that I knew I could trust him. If he was willing to do that, he has holes in his hands in heaven, y'all. And I looked at my hand through the hole in his hand, and I looked back up at him, and I said, yes, Lord, I trust you. And the vision is over. I'm standing in the living room. And 16 months later, we started a church and a funeral home. And it's been awesome and terrible. <laughs> and I've never stopped trusting him. Jeremiah 17. Thus says the Lord, cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. He is like a shrub in the desert and shall not see any good come. He shall dwell in the parched places of the wilderness in an uninhabited salt land. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. And whose trust is the Lord? He is like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when heat comes. For, it leaves, for its leaves remain green and is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. Blessed is the man that trusts in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. The Lord, not the Savior, not the God, the Lord, Lordship. I'll end with this statement from Oswald Chambers. Faith never knows where it is being led but it loves and knows the one who is leading. I didn't know where God was going to take us 14 years ago, but I trust the God that was taking us. I can assure you, you can trust the God that wants to take you into places that you can't see. You can trust his hand holding your hand. There's a hole in it to prove it. Please rise, I'd like to bless you. Please receive the blessing that the Father has for you. He calls you beloved, the ones that are greatly loved. And we, he and I both desire that you experience prosperity and his type of divine health. And the way this happens is by allowing your soul to prosper through intimacy with him and knowledge of his word. I love you and I'll see you again soon.